All right, wow. boys. That felt that felt that really, was a good clap. Really nice, thank you. Good job, Kendall. Thanks. It's the first time we've done a podcast together in a minute. It is. We've got some things to talk about. Maybe a um, lot to go on on right yeah. now, including we've got about an hour and a half cap on this one because we have some potential new ten, potential new teammates coming. Yeah, we're gonna put them through the ringer. It's a tryout. It's a inter- season tryout. Internship. Sequin internship. I thought about doing some kind of like a hazing? competition. Well, I mean, <laughs> for lack of a better gonna, words, there's definitely going to be some sort of hazing going on. But <laughs> um, yeah, some kind of competition where it's like you put some pressure on them, be like, like it, I, I should. We should have said like, hey, bring your bows. But there's some, you know, there's a couple guys coming from out of town where it's like, hey, last person's out, first person is on the show. Man. Just just really set the tone early. Just put some <laughs> pressure very on. Very odd challenge. It has nothing to do with hunting. Yeah, I, I agree put with that. Put them through and be like, all right, well, you're gone. See ya. We can do leave. something like that. Yeah. We've got time to brainstorm. But <laughs> yeah, that that's an exciting kind of uh, maybe phase of where we're at is, you know, we've just kind of realized like it's time to, well, one, the, the pressure of like having to perform every year. Like we've kind of rolled the dice the last few seasons and like we've had some really good momentum like you killing your first mule deer your first elk the deer that you've killed you've had like last year you had a phenomenal season yeah it was awesome season and uh even the year before that and it's just like we know that that's not always going to be the case and it's like we can't really uh you know we I, i think i think it's important we show like the ups and downs but it's like there's some bad years coming for sure and it's like it'd be nice to have yeah knock on wood uh, it'd be nice to have some extra faces where it's like if if we're having a bad year because we've experienced the first year we started filming we had a terrible year yeah. and it's like we had no wind in the sails and it's like to have a few other people that are I think in kind of you know different areas of of like what they do and who they are just to kind of have in the mix uh, I think will one take the pressure off of us but also two I think just like give people a different look at some other faces and kind of some fresh content opportunities, stuff like that. Yeah, you've been saying every year you say, you know, we could go into a season and none of us could kill our target buck. And every year you kill like <laughs> four of your target bucks. I know. but So I, something I, crazy would have to happen. Yeah. But I, I also think it's exciting because, of course, we're built on telling stories, right? Yeah. And so these are just going to be new stories from a different perspective, which I think our fans are going to mm. really enjoy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've, we've been talking about bringing on new faces for a while. And this is, this is kind of getting into, like, the business side of running a YouTube channel. But we have struggled figuring out how to get a production team big enough that can handle like pu- putting out content quickly just for us. Yeah. So that's been a big thing that's kind of held us back of adding new talent on earlier on is just being able to pump out content like within a few weeks after us that's, capturing it. That's definitely been our biggest bottleneck. It, yeah. For sure. And it's I, I don't think people realize how difficult that is, especially with the way that we're trying to film and edit these videos. We're not just kind of throwing stuff together. Um it's not like we're trying to tell a story. We're trying yeah. to be cinematic with it, and that takes a long time. Yeah. I mean, a deer story probably takes a full five days of editing that w- from someone that's like talented and experienced to pump out. Well, so, the the Kimbo story. I mean, Forrest did that one. He and he did a phenomenal job, but it was like a month and a half of putting that together. Really? Oh yeah. I mean, because you know we killed that deer October tenth. And the story came out on Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. so about a month and a half later, and it's and it was just like, you know, when it's out there, it's 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 done and it's final. There's no going back, and you know that story was just like so, I mean, just important to me personally. But you know, we want also want to like show everything as much as we can of what happened, and it's like you, the the art form of like having what happened actually. And then having that translate through the camera for people to watch is like that portion of it right there is so hard to do mm-hmm. and pull off. And it, it is like monumental amounts of time. Especially on a story like that where there's yeah. multiple trips, multiple years involved. Yeah. And you have to piece the, piece the story together. It's very different when you go hunt for a week somewhere. Maybe it's an elk hunt or something. Yeah. And like you, that's, you tell the story in a week and that's it. 
yeah. and you can kind of condense it all down. But when you're like going back and forth, the story gets broken up. It makes it hard to tell. But yeah. so this year we just uh, we brought on a production team. Um, we kind of tried them out during turkey season, and things went really well. And so they're on full bore with us this fall. Um, and so that kind of triggered us to go ahead with adding new new faces to the content side. Yeah. Um, and there's a, it was hard to pick who we should even consider because we have, we have so many people that obviously are, would love to be, you know, doing what we're doing. Um, but there's just so much that goes into picking the right person. Um, I don't, I don't think we should, we definitely shouldn't say names yet. Cause we don't even like today is the meeting where we say, Hey, this is what y'all are getting into. Yeah. Like we literally have a contract and in a, a statement of conduct that we're going to have them sign. Um, so we'll, we'll leave the names uh, anonymous right now, but we got five guys, four from the South, three from three from Atlanta area. Yeah. One from originally from Virginia and then one from Florida. Yeah. And I, I think what's cool about, you know, the people that we're having conversations with is <clears throat> there's kind of a category of like someone who's a little more established, um, you know, a, a killer. Proven, yeah. Very proven. And then you've kind of got like the the young guns, like the the up and comers, kind of like the next generation. Like they're not going to be the um, – they just don't have as enough years of experience under their belt yet. And it's like, you'll kind of hopefully, you know, see that portion of where they're at and maybe people can learn certain things from them that they wouldn't necessarily learn from the other guy. And it's like, we're kind of trying to, you know, have a, a mix of uh, different varieties of like people. Yeah. For, I mean, people are going to relate to different personalities sure. and different ages. The, sure. the youngest guy in the group that we have right now is 18. Yep, eighteen years 18, old. Mm. Yeah. So I, I was actually thinking about this when we were moving the deer down to your trophy room, and you pointed out like the oldest, the oldest mounts in this room, you killed in college. So you were probably 19, 18? 18, 19, Yeah. And it, about, it's, about it's, the same same age. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. crazy. Like looking at the guy that we're talking about, like he's farther along than we were at for that, sure at that yeah, age. Yeah, for he, sure. He's he's dialed in. Yeah, and so. To to imagine that what his, could become his room could look like this and yeah what his journey may what, look like fifteen years yeah it's, it's crazy yeah it, it's gonna be fun and like uh and I and I've told these guys up front like we're kind of dipping our toes in the water this year like right. we don't know what this is gonna look like we don't know how this is gonna go you may get into this and be like you know I just I don't want to do this. I'd rather just kind of keep doing my own thing or like, I'd rather just hunting be hunting and not have to worry about like the content side of it. Um, it's like, so we're kind of like just feeling this out. You know, it's like the, the faces we may originally include now may not be the ones who stick around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're just kind of in a new phase and trying to figure that out. And the only way to figure it out is just to do it. So, well, uh, one thing I think that they're going to have to figure out this season, which it has taken us years to figure out, is the balance of, like, family, friends, work, whatever, and the hunting content. Do you all have that figured out yet? Because I, 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 I don't I'm, at all. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about it yeah. right now. I mean, I, I've, I've really had to kind of lay out my entire season to the best of my ability. But, of course, when a deer shows up randomly, Everything you, you don't have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So, it's it's a balance. Yeah, it's getting harder for me. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure <laughs> I'm in the stage of got a what 14 month old. Um, yeah, it's yeah. time is harder to come by. Well, you're you're in a different timeline than I am when I've got a 12 year old and a 16 yeah. year old. I'm about to have somebody that I can say, hey, go to the grocery store because yeah. uh, I don't have time to go. Yeah, so she's a good babysitter. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I feel like you're kind of getting into the stage where it maybe it might get a little easier, like yeah. require less of your attention, and I'm the opposite. And yeah. Lee, I don't know what, where Lee's at right now. I don't know. I don't know where I'm at either. <laughs> Lee's got Lee's got some uh, big life changing events happening. At a crossroads uh, soon too. So, 
Yeah, you may you may become the face of this whole thing when you're an empty nester. It's just Kendall, just like you know, living the free life. Haven't out seen there. Lear Drew in six yeah. months. I, I'm just wondering if when Adrian shows up, if there's going to be like flowers and stuff down here uh, in the trophy no, room. No, well, no, so. that that's it's that's kind of a funny subject because <laughs> this room was not, you know, on like the personal behind the scenes side was not as smooth sailing as you'd think. Oh, look, I have no doubt about that. Like. uh you know, it, well, here's – we're getting personal. So, apparently – She doesn't want the nursery to be in the basement, though. No, 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 no. But here's – well, this is what it boils down to. Apparently, when you're engaged, you start making decisions together. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and I was still just kind of operating on my own accord. And I'm like, yeah, I've always wanted to – like, in the back of my mind, I've always wanted to turn this – this basement into where I've moved my deer heads. It was just an unfinished basement. I, I think I've lived in this house five years and it's like, I got no use out of the basement at all. It made all the sense in the world. And so I was just like operating as if, you know, full steam ahead, like whatever, I'm just making my decisions. And then I, I quickly realized like, uh, there's sort of this feeling of like, that's going to be my home too. I didn't know any of this was happening. And I was like, Oh yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe I should have mentioned that. I was going to completely redo the basement. Like I didn't even mention it at all until it was happening. And so not that she would have changed anything or done anything different. It was just like, you know, maybe uh, some better communication. Well, there. Yeah. 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 I mean, she'll at least be happy. Your, your Fortnite command center is going to be, moved down down it'll be moved room. down yeah. here for sure. Um, but yeah, back to uh, these five guys. Part of me wants to look at it as like a tryout, but I also don't really want to look at it as a tryout. I, 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 but I do want to make it clear to them, like, all of you guys may crush it this year, and we want to keep all of you guys in content, or none of y'all yeah, right. might be asked to, to stick around. Um, I want the, I want to see what – we're going to put them through a few challenges. I don't want to tell, talk about what the challenges are. I don't think we should tell them what the challenges are I don't are either. Yet. Yeah. I want to get them in a room on camera and then just, like, spill the beans. Um but we got a few challenges, and then I think we'll we'll give them each an opportunity to maybe film a hunt that they like a deer that they've found and they're chasing, and kind of make it a solo story. Um, but I mean, like you just said, your plans could go totally haywire yeah. during a season. You could kill nothing, and you know, I'm just I'm I'm interested to see how this plays out, and I want to I want to hear feedback from our audience of like who they're who they're enjoying watching, like. Yeah, who that's, they want to see stick around. Yeah, that's going to be, I think, an important part of it because it's it's kind of an art form of like how to start naturally including other people. You don't want to just be like, you know, pluck people out of the air that that's have right. nothing to do with us, and it's like just you know, because they they've killed big deer yeah, before. Yeah, so it's like, uh, you know, kind of a natural inclusion, a natural sort of unfolding of things is is what we're hoping for. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the other component to this is like. Um, and I think this has happened. I'm sure this has happened to other shows. Um, you also run the risk of like, what if someone, one of these guys, get, one of these people goes rogue and goes and poaches a deer under the Seek One name. And it's like, you know, the backlash that the, the risk we take on that end too. Mm -hmm. Well, you that's, know. that's where the conduct comes in for sure. And, and we've got to be very careful about that because we have a brand to, uphold yeah, yeah so. and that's why in everything we do we try to be as transparent as possible for so sure like if something ever like that ever happened like we would just tell everybody yeah and that's part of what's going to be in their contract like them acknowledging that if they do something like that we're not going to brush it under the rug we're going to tell everybody yeah I, i've to tried protect to, our, to protect our brand yeah, yeah. and I, that was one of the first things I've, I've tried to be clear on is like hey when you cross this line and like there is no 99%. There's it's it's 100% or nothing. And it's like you may not if that's not your thing and you don't want to have to worry about being 100% on everything then then maybe this isn't for you. Mm. And I've been pretty clear with that, you know, up front with them of like, look, there is there's no it's black and white. But that is a risk we run is like, you know, the it's it's way easier to not get caught up in a technicality on, you know, lease property, family farm, bigger property line, public, whatever. When you're dealing with like smaller 
properties, like very, uh, you know, five foot this way, one foot this way, like you do all these property lines and stuff in these suburban areas and small property areas. Like you have to be so dialed on everything. And it's like, there's just way more to get tripped up, not even intentionally, just unintentionally, um, in suburban areas, because there's just, there's so much more that, that kind of goes into it as far as like, you know, property lines and, you know, all, all, all the deal. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes it a lot harder. You have limitations that are, are way more than if you have like a big block of woods. And then it's also just the pressure of getting that content, that kill and everything on film on top of just hunting period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like which one of these guys is going to handle pressure well and who mm -hmm. isn't? I mean, we've, we've had situations in the past where it's like our shooter is five foot across the property line and you can't, and he's broadside 20 yards and you just can't shoot him. And it's like, you, you can't, you know, you, it's just, everything has to be perfect. And it's like, yeah. we've, we've seen or just experienced like having to do everything right. And it's like, I mean, we've passed on deer that are just across the property line, just across the Creek. And it's like, you can't shoot that deer. Yeah. The the deer in Tennessee last summer, uh, or last last season, uh, he originally like came down this hill, and I, I don't know he's forty yards broadside, but just across the line. Even Bain years years and years back, when he came across, I think you were with me, mm -hmm. came across the top of that hill, and it's like he's just off the off the property line. It's just like you know, everything has to be dialed. So there there is a little bit of risk to bringing on new people, um, but I think that. These guys are solid. We wouldn't really choose anybody that we would, were worried about. But, uh, you yeah, know, that is that, a dynamic that, yeah, that is real. That's what I was going to say. I, I mean, we're, I feel a very good judge of character, and I think that these guys are, are solid. They're not people. random dudes. Yeah, yeah. And, and we've known most of them for a, a period of time. Yeah. yeah. A long period of time. And some of them have been helping us out for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really important that we kind of build – more of the team dynamic with Seek One. I mean, part of it is just the the difficulty of relying on the three of us for content. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that burden has fallen on Lee. Um, but being able to have, like, a larger team dynamic, being able to go on hunts together, be in camps together, that really does kind of um, – people really gravitate towards that. Like, you look Agreed. at – we've always talked about on the business side, we want to be – similar to like the Guggen squad or meat eater is, I guess is sort of a similar example or like good, good golf where there's a team dynamic, but each person has kind of their own personality and we do videos together as a team and then we, individuals can go out and do videos on their own. Yeah. Um, and so this is like the first step towards building that, that bigger team. Yeah. It's, it's so hard. Like, cause y'all know what it takes to commit to a certain deer. Yeah. And it's like, it's all in. There's nothing else. Like, it's all in. And it's hard, like, if that deer's showing up and it's like, hey, we've got this kind of group uh, trip scheduled. And it's like, but this deer's showing up. It's like, that makes it really hard to break away from, from you know, this deer you've put everything into. And it's like that kind of juggle and balance is a difficulty we've had. And so, yeah, I'm hoping that, like, with more people, there will be more of a, a more of a group dynamic that kind of naturally unfolds. Um, if if you're committed to some big deer you're chasing, it's like we've got a trip planned, or vice versa with you. Or any, you know, so that 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 I think is a one of the big benefits that we'll hopefully see is is mm -hmm. we've we've had so many laughs, and and that's where most of the laughs come from is when you're with your boys. Yeah, those are the most fun times. So like we want to make sure that we keep that. It's it's hard to do trips like that as a group for whitetail hunting. Yeah, and with the way that we do it. Yeah, when we're going after a specific buck. Yeah, because we don't we don't you're have all, you're all in separate areas. Yeah, separate I mean. areas. Like we don't have a big property yet, where we can all go and just like hunt and have fun together. So that's that's a challenge, but that's also something that we're working towards is finding some lease property. Um, probably start in the southeast, looking at some potential stuff and out out in Oklahoma. Yep. But we're still on the on the hunt for a lease property where we can kind of get more of those group dynamic videos and then I'm not gonna say this is the last year that I'm gonna fully commit to chasing. He giant says deer. this yeah. every every year. single year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I, I'm gonna go out counting next year. On, uh, we on actually video. we have it on video. Is he going with us this year? Nope. You know what deer I'm hunting though. 
look. It's, it's before that season even opens. Yes. You'll be back. I, I I can't. What are you gonna do? Go baby like go babysit him. Babysit that deer for Put two him to weeks bed every night. season. Put him to bed every night. <laughs> I, I if anyone if you see a truck drive by and someone looks into the I know, he's that field freak out. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk to him for like three hours a day of him stressing <laughs> yeah. out. This, about this it. truck drove by and it kind of drove by slow and like I know he was better in those woods. Like yeah, no the the, it's the mental coming, warfare. Drew, be, no. Have your phone ready. I am. My full intentions are to commit next year to do some more diverse hunts, a elk hunt, a mule deer hunt, something like that. That's my intention. <laughs> intention. It, yeah. It's it is my intention. Um, because I do I do want to experience other stuff, but um, I think what is just I don't know like has driven my passion to this point is like the the obsession of finding a specific animal, and I just I I can't think about anything else. So it's just like you can still do that. I can't though. It's it's like it's almost like if if it was the week leading into the season where I'm gonna hunt this buck and we're elk hunting, I'm not even going to be present in the elk hunt. Like my, I, I just feel like my mind would be so absent and I, I'm actually, I'm again, <laughs> intention. I'm actually looking forward to having a year where I'm almost kind of like clean slate where it's like, don't Here, know here's what's, what's going to happen. happen. He's going to kill one of these big deers after this year. He's going to call us and be like really upset and just like frustrated with all the drama he had to go through to kill it. And he's going to say, I'm never doing it again. <laughs> and then three weeks are going to go by, and he's going to get sent a picture of another, like, 2.30. <laughs> and he'll drive 14 hours to go door knock. Yeah. <laughs> and it'll just the cycle continues. Yeah. And he'll promise that he's going to go on an elk hunt or a caribou hunt. And then we'll sit here again next year. My intention. Have the same conversation. <laughs> I, I, I think we may need to find something <laughs> out of country that's outside of whitetail season that we that's can true. do. Because, that's true. Uh, yeah, maybe it's I was, Ar- Argentina Red Stag or something. Like, it, you've got to come and experience an elk hunt, Red Stag hunt, or something. Because once you hear that noise, you will be addicted. Yeah, maybe not like this. I'm honestly not that mad that you're not coming this year. Yeah. So it, Kendall, Kendall has a tag in the same New Mexico unit that well, I've hunted the last my couple years. years. A little bit. The reason, <laughs> the, the reason that I'm glad is because. <laughs> The last few years, I, I killed a bull two years ago, and then that trip, and then last year was just like chasing bulls around for ten days, and it's just like this like cat and mouse game, and it's very difficult to get a shot on one. I know you would show up, <laughs> not knowing how to call, not like having all, like wearing tennis shoes and PFG shorts, and kill like a three fifty. <laughs> one would just like run into you. Yeah, would, would that help the team dynamic, or would that hurt? Uh, it, it would. It, it would literally hurt. stick a knife in my gut because I, yeah, I've been, gone I, for seven it, years. Yeah, I've gone seven years. I've had tons of opportunities. I could have taken many shots at elk and just didn't because I was holding out or whatever. And like, I'm really feeling the vibe this year because Lee and I, or Drew and I, have had some special times in the woods. Like when I shot that six pointer at the very end of the season. Like, and we don't really get to hunt together a lot Mm -mm. you and i don't get to hunt together a lot so those times are really special to me and like i'm obsessed with elk hunting um just being out west the big woods and just i i feel so close to god every time i go out there and uh we're gonna have fun Mm -hmm. we're we're gonna get into the the big white tail grind is a lone man's game at least for me it's it's been a lone man's game yeah but uh yeah no i again I know reality may be different, but my intention is to next year do some more yeah. of that. But, but on recording again, by the way, <laughs> this is a little uh, more documented because I had a couple of margaritas in that last video that, that I committed. <laughs> you were like a few sips in the one, margarita. yeah, it was a like, skinny margarita. Come on. <laughs> you're, you're not that big of a lightweight, are you? <laughs> but no, you're you're right about the white tail game being like a lone lone man and lonely man's game. It definitely takes a toll on you. Um, we were just at the World Deer Expo, and I th- it was either one or two people called me out on this, but they were like, <laughs> "Hey, you haven't killed a whitetail in two years. Like, what? Do, when are you gonna kill something?" <laughs> and I was like, "You're right, I haven't." And uh, part of the reason is because of it being like a lonely and just like frustrating 
journey to chase these these big whitetails and urban especially in urban areas yeah uh i guess it was two seasons ago coming up on three seasons ago i was hunting that a giant in cincinnati and spent i don't know how many trips we went up there that year it was at least seven um including scouting and hunting knocked on 550 doors (laughs) and got like his got permission basically in his bedroom was getting pictures of him went up there almost i had him coming in following a doe and then he the doe turned down the hill and i never saw him again in person after that he kept showing up on camera but hunted that deer all year uh he disappeared late in the year thought he was gone how how close was he when he came in to you he was f- five steps from being in a 25 yard shooting lane jeez and that deer was he was probably 200 inches that year for he was uh, over, yeah, over 200, 200. he's probably like 210 maybe really because i so fast forward uh found found someone else got pictures of him the next year um so i knew he's alive he showed back up at my spot on or actually a different spot that I was hunting him at like a mile away on Halloween. And then the neighbor killed him like two hours after he showed up on my camera. I'd already packed up my stuff to drive up to Ohio. And I woke up that next morning and got the text. The deer was didn't, like hanging in. Didn't the guy like a processor. Uh, didn't even know the deer was there. Um, or did he know no, it was, it was there? The, Cause it was the first time that deer had left his like summer area and came over there. And, and I don't, he, he didn't, just, he he didn't have pictures there. of him the year before either. So he didn't know it. He didn't know no. that deer at all. He knew the deer was in the area because pictures had had circulated, sure. but he had never gotten a picture of him on his mm-hmm. camera. At least I don't think he had. I, he, he's if you listen to this, I may remember it incorrectly, but I'm pretty sure he hadn't got pictures. That wild. Of him. I I that is something I haven't experienced that Kendall has. Yeah. And I I don't recall if you had. Well, the uh, King maybe, where it's just like yeah, you're just there. the you just, right day. You just go right in place, blind. Right time, yeah, so and, and this rogue giant buck shows up that you had no idea about mm-hmm. and i mean that was your biggest deer Moses. Yeah, Moses, yeah i mean that was uh i mean that's the time of year it happens yeah like yeah here th- in georgia thanksgiving late, morning late september early october yeah. but it's so rare these days with you know trail cams and stuff that like you don't have an idea of of something that's in the area it's or a gonna, fraction mm-hmm. of what you what is happening in yeah the woods. but well, but also outside of trail cams social media and the way that deer pictures get sent around like it's hard for a deer to be out there and not have you know somebody yeah. knowing someone knowing about this, it and, yeah. and locals knowing about this, it and this all that area stuff. of ohio is there's a lot of woods yeah it's a lot more woods than not guess, very urban. where we're i mean it, it is urban but there's like big blocks of like multi, several hundred acre blocks of woods that, yeah. are, that are private um and it's very thick out there like it's river bottoms just thick nasty stuff so de- deer can disappear in there but long story short, I scored the deer at 195, I think. Um, and he had lost his, like, drop time, lost some points. Like, he got significantly smaller. And so I think he was probably, like, 205, 210 the year, the year before. You had um, him at 25 yards. Yeah, in the snow, too. Oh, man. So, anyways, mm. that like, that was a dagger to the heart because I spent so much time just, like, sitting in the truck driving up there door knocking and then like being in the right spot and then it just doesn't happen yeah and then it for it to end the way that it did where <laughs> he shows up and then literally the property next door the guy kills it and i never didn't even know well, the deer was there I mean, that, that day kind of back to what i was saying earlier of like you know having a bad season like i know it's coming is like dude the the same thing could have happened to me on on in recent history, a lot of these stories that have happened is like, you make all these trips, you put all this effort and then just something happens and it, it's done. Mm-hmm. It's like, I've been lucky to this point that like the chips have fallen my, fall my way. And it's like, you've experienced kind of the other end of that on, on several deer, not even yeah. just that deer, but like the Poseidon deer from, from I years ago. I still have not killed a white tail buck out of the state of Georgia. Really? Yeah. And it, like same, <laughs> it's sad. And I'm I did not here, know that. You got 30 giants on your wall right here, which what 10 of them or 10 or more from out of state yeah but uh, yeah like same deal with that nashville buck that i hunted for several Seven, years yeah it's like uh, i'm he in was the right probably, spot doing the right things at least i think i am seeing and it him just doesn't happen yeah he was probably pushing too yeah yeah one, one of the years he was yeah one year 100 percent less so anyways it, that that hunt was like the tipping point for me of just being like this is not fun 
yeah. to do it to do this do it this way and like not have success. And so I I kind of took a step back from whitetails for a couple years. Um, ended up losing some of my Atlanta spots that were pretty good, and then just spots just kind of go through cycles and get shot out and stuff. And so I just for like sure. haven't had the last two years. I haven't had a deer that I've been excited to chase. Yeah, but I've been excited to go out west and like experience those hunts. Yeah, but. Well, I- this year I need to kill a whitetail. <laughs> oh, it's hap- it's happening. It's going to be your year. You chased a pretty Thanks, good man. one end of the year last year that made yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, like a a 150. Yeah. Which is a great great Georgia deer, but it's not a not one that you're going to drive you, across you, the country to It's going to happen at some point for you cuz there's been the Poseidon And I've hunted three 200s that's that That's what I was going to say. The Poseidon deer which that was college, right? Or four 200s. Yeah. That was a 200-inch deer in Georgia. The Tennessee deer, which was probably pushing 200. The Ohio deer, which was definitely 200. Six what what other? Six. Six, yeah. Killed. Yeah. The other like that's Georgia another one. perfect story of just my yeah. luck. <laughs> well, that means uh, it's, it's just You've due to happen. You've killed some giants. Yeah. I mean, too. don't discredit I mean, that. Come on. <laughs> let, 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 let's, uh, let's don't. Yeah. I understand that you've had some tough years, but you're a killer and like it's going to happen. Oh, thanks, man. Um, it's going to happen. Uh, it's funny. Like, We've naturally gone there, but I was going to ask you to tell the story about that Ohio buck because I yeah. we're going to do an episode on it, right? Yeah, yeah. I need to f- film a little interview here, probably to, like tomorrow or the next day, and then we'll release that in the next month. I'm ex- I'm excited to see that one. I mean, I'm sure the footage, and then even you going and seeing that deer in person, which I I had the same thing happen uh, at a deer in Michigan, and I did. I put, <laughs> dude. I don't even know how many hours of driving. It's it's a 26-hour round trip. I was driving up there just to change trail cam batteries. Like if a camera would go dead, be like, all right, I'm 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 going. Uh, and this deer, I, I actually posted a uh, – it's like a cell phone clip someone had on Instagram about it. And every single comment is talking about like the Mitch Rumpala buck, which was like the very controversial like world record deer. And I, I know that, like, when we saw that deer, I was like, man, that... Because I, th- I think the world record uh, archery is, like, 204. And looking at that deer, I was like, man, I he's he, I don't think he would break it, but I think he's close, close. to a 200-inch straight-up typical 10, mm-hmm. which is, like, flirting with world record-type deer. And I posted it, and it was like... Ev- that's what everybody was saying, was just, like, you know the Mitch Paula buck or, you know, that's world, you know, potential world record, this, that, and the other. But the story of that year was like, I was making trips for three years and he went downhill, uh, after the year he was as his biggest. And I had him showing up on camera, like could have potentially hunted him. And then I, I didn't because I was like, he's not as big as he was. Like he had an injury. Maybe he'll recover and be that world-class buck again. And then he, this, the year, this past season, he was just a gigantic eight pointer with a drop time. He was over 180, and, and I'm telling you, frame wise, that's the biggest whitetail because because a, a guy bigger than the one that you have sheds of. Yes. This year. Yes. Really. Well, just as, like with she, just sheer like width and real estate that it's taken up. The biggest whitetail I've ever seen. It dude, it was a dinosaur. Oh, I saw pictures. And. <laughs> Same deal, you know. The uh, you put all this time and effort into that deer, and then uh, a, another guy who they're two brothers up there. They're good dudes. They ended up killing it, and I got to go see it, which was cool. We'll do an episode of that, but it's like you know what he ended up scoring one one eighties. Yeah, as an eight, <clears throat> it, dude. I'm telling you, like it, his frame was insane. Oh, dude, it was crazy. Yeah. I would love to have known what he was in his prime. that year that he was his biggest. Yeah, and you think he that deer weighed like. Well, well over 300? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like, we've seen now, and, I, you know, I know we kind of, like... People always call BS when we say deer weighs 300. That's They're what I was going like, to say. Like, like, no way. It's like, well, the scale said it would, was 300. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. <laughs> but, I, you know, we've seen some legit, especially, like, uh, some of the deer in Ohio that we've seen. Dude, this deer was something else. It uh, it was like a horse. It was It was just... It was unreal how big that thing was. Mm-hmm. But anyways, yeah, that's just uh, – I've, I've experienced, you know, the so much effort into one thing, and it just doesn't doesn't yeah. work out. And that's okay. Like, 
that deer was taken by another hunter who did it right that's a win because a lot of these deer you know just kind of vanish and you know we catch kind of hints of what happened to them or whatever but i'm kind of curious to hear because I, I, your story of moses yeah i mean it, that was uh I had a business trip and I had just gotten home. Family was down at my in-laws for Thanksgiving. And so I was 100% going hunting. And what, what uh, year, when was this? 2010. We were like barely friends. Like, like yeah. we were loose friends, yeah. but we weren't like tight at yeah. that time. I but, think it was this that kind of. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, yeah, because he ended up landing in your friend's parents' backyard. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I mean, Thanksgiving morning, it was one of those magical mornings that you just always dream of. Like there was chasing, grunting, fighting. I mean, I think I probably saw like 15 different bucks that morning, but I was hunting in a ground blind, uh, and was just seeing tons of action. It was about nine 30 and all of a sudden, uh, this eight pointer comes running past me. And then all of a sudden a doze like right behind him and i'm like wait a second this isn't how this is supposed to go and then all of a sudden at 10 yards next to me moses shows up and literally just had snot dripping out his nose it was cold morning just had breath going and i'd one but i'd only seen another one other deer bigger than that before in the woods and i i froze for a second i was just like what is this like i've never seen this deer i've had cameras all over the place and come to find out one of our other friends had pictures of that exact buck six miles away at like midnight and this is 9 30 in the morning that deer traveled six miles in like 12 hours or nine hours that's that's what kind of sparked a little controversy right right yeah well yeah after i shot it um, one of the police officers in the area had seen that deer, you know, a long ways away. And when I shot the deer, people were questioning where did I shoot it, whatever. Totally told the whole story. And it was, well, this deer was literally like, you know, six miles away. Are you sure that's, that's where you shot it? Like, yeah, yeah, they have legs. Yeah. And, uh, but I just, <laughs> I mean, we know deer travel, especially during the rut, like crazy distances. I think but for people that don't know, like it's mind blowing how far a suburban deer will travel. Like that's yeah. a misconception is that like, oh, they're, if he's in 10 acres, he just lives in that 10 acres. And it's like, no, nah, there's, there's no boundaries for these deer. Yeah. Well, it, it's, you know, it's the whole spaghetti and meatballs thing. It's like yeah. they, they don't have a gigantic block of woods that can just run around in. Like if they are on a hot doe, like they literally are just going in a straight line for six miles. Yeah. And so he basically came up on this shelf in, in front of me. I made a perfect shot and he acted like nothing had happened. Like he was so jacked up on that doe that uh, he was just like, and I'm like, what did I miss? Like, I swear I like smoked him. He started walking off. And so I, Popped another one at him, and he th never ran. Continued to walk. Did he fall down? He he like yeah he like stumbled down. Like the second then, shot, yeah, I thought I remember telling me he fell. Second over. shot fell down, got back up, and then literally started walking after that doe again. So I like literally jumped through the ground blind, <laughs> like to try to get another arrow in this thing. I was like, what is going on? Like I swear I smoked him, and then I saw him stumble. And basically going to your buddy's parents' backyard. And uh, that's when I called you. And I was like, I don't know what I just shot, but I swear it's the biggest deer I've So there were pictures circulating of that deer yeah. that, that you and I had seen. Yeah. But it was just like this kind of mystery deer. Like we didn't really know where and it was. I didn't was. think it was in that area. Yeah. Like, I mean, we heard it was. And then uh, after seeing pictures of that deer the previous year, those surfaced after I shot it too. And still never had pictures of that deer the previous year. What, so. what direction did he come from? Basically came from the north um, and then heading south to where I shot it. And, but yeah. it's just, it's still crazy to think that like, and that's what's so exciting about the rut. And that's why we love the rut. Like you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. That was back in the day, like, especially in that area, back in that day, there were some freaks that would and just show They up. would just show because yeah. there, there were far less people hunting back yeah. then. You also and, couldn't bait. And those deer would get old. Yeah. And we also like, 
were in his network together and didn't have cameras everywhere. Yeah. I remember, I think it was Bob's pictures yeah. that are like, they look like they're taken on a, <laughs> like a Kodak. Pol- Polaroid pol- camera. Polaroid camera <laughs> of just giants yeah. over in that area. Yeah. There's like three, but they're so wild looking and they look like they're 10 years old each. Yeah, right in that same area, Bob was hunting and had that one deer that come he skid, through. right? That he skid. And that deer had come probably a good six or seven miles yeah. away, too. Sa- same exact storyline, pretty much. Yeah. He didn't have pictures of it. He was just hunting. Giant 190-something shows up. And I wish he would do a podcast with us because that dude is... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're talking about Bob. Yeah. Still. Yeah. But well, same deal. Deer how, showed what did, up. What did Moses score? One ninety one and an eighth. Okay. But what was crazy was he calls me and he's like, he didn't know what deer it was at all. He was just like, you know, big deer, obviously freaking out. Yeah. And so we went over there, but we had been seeing these pictures of this, you know, huge deer. And we walk up on it and it's that deer. <laughs> and there was this realization of like, dude, that's that freaking deer that we've been seeing, you yeah. know, pictures getting kind of passed around. I I was just I I was speechless. I, I literally could not talk when I picked that. Thing I have up. the video. Yeah, I know. That was yeah. the Wild West back then. Yeah, yeah. That, over in the, I don't want to say the area, but like it was almost so, like a the the new frontier. Like there were giants out there, and it like it wasn't totally covered up in hunters yet, and you just had no just clue didn't know what, what existed. You didn't know what was going to show up when you stuck a camera out in, in a new spot. It's I, like there t- could be anything. Yeah, two thousand eight, two years before I shot Moses. I had a one acre piece of property that I had nineteen different Pope and Young bucks come through that one acre piece of property. Mm-hmm. There's still I still have one of your old pictures from that property. Yeah. It's the it's the real big wide yeah. deer and he's got that like Freak wicked nasty brow time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He showed up on my anniversary as I was at dinner, the only time he showed up during shooting light and I never saw him again. How long do you think it would take for Atlanta to get back to that point if we just said, Hey, no hunting for I think this quick. Lot, I think it would quick. happen really quick. quick. One, one, there's phenomenal genetics. Two, I mean, there's still a lot of deer yeah. uh, that have that potential. It's just here's what's different now. I love that we've brought so many people into the metro Atlanta areas to hunt. I mean, they're enjoying exactly what we love, right? Has it changed our ability to find those big deer? Yes, but... There are so many good quality deer out there that are 130, 140 now that we, of course, would let walk to get to this status. But a lot of people across Georgia, they never see a deer like that before. So mm-hmm. it's a trophy to them. I don't want to like frown upon them for coming and shooting a 140. Like, no. like that. Yeah, but it would be pretty cool. <laughs> if you, it would be like, great if you guys would just let all those 130s and well, one, no, 140s walk. Let's but. just start a petition. Five years, no hunting within this radius. Uh, honestly, po- poachers included. Totally yeah. joking, but that would be actually yeah. pretty wild. It, it would, it would be crazy if there was no hunting and, and you only just ran cameras just to see what existed. Or does only. I mean, yeah, because deer need to be yeah. shot. I mean, that's it, one of the bigger it, missions it, of what we do. It, is... it would take three years, I think. Yeah, but at five years. Three years, like all the three-year-olds would be 180 plus or 170 plus. Yeah. But it would be wild. Years, yeah. yeah, it would be wild for sure. I mean, there's there are some deer. I had a deer that just, you know, vanished last year and like – uh, I think he was three and the mass he had and like all the inside time points and st- he had, you mm-hmm. know, 20 points as like a three year old. And it's like, I don't know what uh, happened. He could have been hit by a car I, or like, I know, oh, man, I, I know what which talking one you're talking about. about. But, he got shot. you know, it, do you think in fi- if you went five years without hunting Atlanta, that there'd be a, a buck world over, record over two thirty out there? Dude, I've, yes. I've pondered on this a lot. Uh, yes. <laughs> because I, I, I guarantee there would. I've always wondered what the biggest buck to ever exist in the metro Atlanta area was. Well, I can tell you that in 2000, I shot a typical 12-pointer that I'd never seen in my life either. And he was at least 215. As a typical? Yes. Please describe what this looked like because... 
That's the, something I would fantasize about. I mean, <laughs> th- this deer's G2s and G3s were no joke, like 16 inches long. Like, I've never just, seen... Just straight up so, wall. I mean, you could not have come with a better, like, just typical, even, symne- symmetrical rack than that. Mass? I mean, it had it all. I mean... I, I still I look for that deer for three months, three months, and I can't tell you how many times I went and looked. How like dark horns? Yeah. Tell me all the details. Oh, I, it, it, let's don't go there. <laughs> I, I might cry. Um, it it literally was just one of those moments. Where my buddy's dad was a developer. Uh, he put in all new water and sewer lines and roads and new subdivisions, and this was. Yeah, just north of Atlanta, northwest of Atlanta, one of those spots to where it was just a magical spot, impossible to uh, to get like bigger blocks of woods there yeah. because of where it was and um, perfect opportunity and and I hit him right in the shoulder and there were there was a deer uh, years ago it was a picture you know deer in a kudzu patch got passed around and I I tried to get spots but again it's an area it's very difficult. And this this deer was for sure two twenty plus. I mean, he was big giant typical with like every single tine had like another tine on the inside, like going all the way out. I don't know whatever happened to that deer, but you know We know what happened to that deer. I don't know, man. I mean, <laughs> there's a thousand ways that these deer can die, but there's you know, I hunted a deer years ago that had the big uh Actually, you know, big, almost like a caribou-looking shovel on the front. Like, like, yeah, I guarantee you that deer was two fifteen, ballpark, two ten. Yeah, but to go from a two, two fifteen to two thirty is a big jump. Oh, it's crazy! It's crazy. But I'm just saying, like, in our limited experience there, of what we've seen, be, should we at some point post pictures of all the big deer that we don't know where they went and see if any of them surfaced through our family? We have. I mean, we kind of have. Well, well, we did the. I know we did the bucks that, that got bucks away. That got but away but yeah. There's been a lot more that we didn't really have oh, any yeah. story on. Right. But they're just trail camera pictures. Yeah. I'd I be mean, curious. Just yeah. in our limited knowledge of what we've seen just with our own cameras or whatever. And we've we've seen, you know, two ten ish, two fifteen ish type deer. There has to have been at some point a two thirty or more that existed here. I, I remember this is years and years ago. I was at Bass Pro Shops. I mean, dude, this was, you know, I was probably 16, 17 years old. I'm in Bass Pro Shops, and I'm having a, a bow worked on, and the guy that's in there working was like, tell me about this power line that he was driving down or whatever. And he was like, I'm telling you, I saw a 300-inch whitetail. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, you know, was it 300? Probably not. Yeah. But it's for possible. somebody to say, I mean, it's possible, it look sure. At, like, if you look at uh, – What's the uh, Tucker buck yeah. from Gallatin, Tennessee. Tennessee? Yeah, that deer is not that big. He just had points, points everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. and that deer is th- over three hundred. That's what this guy described this yeah. deer as. He was just like it just had stuff points at going everywhere, and it's like you know it's for possible. someone to say yeah. call it three hundred, that's wild. But not like the deer that you have in Ohio right now. There, that thing's never existed in Georgia. In no, like no, that. No, no, so no. The so, he's not three hundred inches, but no. Just but the way sheer bigger mass of that, yeah, no, yeah. it doesn't exist here. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. But you know, if the guy called it three hundred, was it two fifty? Maybe, who knows? But I, I definitely think at some point a deer like that existed around here, and maybe it was years and years and years ago. But maybe there's one out there right now. There honestly could be. Someone's probably gonna listen to this and be like, "Hey, hey, hey, hey I got, <laughs> I got a little camera." <laughs> <laughs> By um, the way, send us that picture. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got some stuff kind of changing gears here, like on the inside Seek One, which we kind of started off with talking about new faces, but like we've got some stuff uh, maybe behind the scenes that people would potentially be interested in kind of knowing about, which the probably the main one is the processor. Yeah, I I've taken a new stance on talking about things that we have in the works. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm, so, I'm <laughs> and sometimes it takes longer than yeah, we think it's I don't, going to I take. I don't like this is a term that Alex used yesterday. I don't like pump faking. 
and talking about yep. something and thinking that it's going to happen in a certain time frame and then it doesn't. Yep. And yeah. then th- it's talking about it again and then it doesn't happen again. But with the processor, we've made a lot of progress. Um, there is a possibility of a processor being open this this fall. That's all I'll say. Yeah. I, and I don't want to dig too deep into it. I think the main point I want to make is like we're still – It's it's been very – like political maybe with opening a processor in the city, but like we are still, it's just been more difficult than we thought. They, they said running, starting a business would be easy. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah. I don't care what business it is. Like there's just so much more to it than you, than you think just from the surface. But our full intention is like, we are still trying to make that yeah. come to life. We are making it's extremely gonna happen. good progress. It's going to happen. And, and it's just when it's going to happen. Yeah. That's right. The other interesting thing is that your connections are uh, potentially going to have us in office space. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've been working at a hotel, and we're actually doing our model rooms in the Sequin headquarters. So those will end up uh, turning into offices when we're all said and done. But, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of – when you're building a hotel, you typically do two model rooms to basically – iron out any kinks or any, you know, construction issues or anything you want to change before you go and duplicate that, you know, 125 times. So, Mm. um, it was a great opportunity for the developer to have a space to do it. And it's a win-win for everybody because we're going to have some really sweet offices when when, when it's done. I can't wait for that to be done. Yeah. Well, they're, they're making good progress. I think they're going to be done, uh, framing, uh, here in the next probably midweek this week. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, I went by there last night, and it, they they've made some good progress. Yeah. It's cool just seeing, seeing the space come together. Yeah. It's like I've looked at a plan so many times <laughs> and tried to like picture what it's gonna look like, but yeah. now it's finally spatially coming together. Yeah. It's gonna be cool. We're yeah. gonna have so we'll have those two, two hotel rooms, which will be they'll be hotel rooms for probably what uh, six, six months over, to a year. Yeah, a year. Um, which will be good for like having. Can we people. like stay in them? Well, don't I mean don't tell no. the hotel, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which will turn into offices. If you fall asleep at the office sometime, yeah. that's you. You're just working hard. So like our yeah. office is going to be like us in hotel rooms, basically. <laughs> well, there's plenty of space outside the hotel rooms <laughs> for office in the meantime, but then we're also building a like a big studio podcast room. Um, this is going to be hard. To, this room. is going to be kind of hard to top, but uh, yeah, I don't it, think Adrian's going to appreciate if there's like a bunch of dudes down here. Oh come on! Every she, day. She, knows she, she, she knows that's just yeah. part of it, <laughs> right, Adrian? She, I I maybe have described her. In a, she's cool. Like she's just cool. Uh, you, she's she's awesome. Really funny. Well, you, you don't want people coming in and out of your house all the stop, time. But no, yes. not all the time. Which um, we w- another thing we're talking about doing is in order to make the the studio room cool to get mounts in there is we're replicas. talking about doing replica mounts yep. of like six to eight of our biggest deer, AKA yeah. six to eight of Lee's biggest deer and, <laughs> and Moses. Um, oh yeah. And you don't have any giants hanging in your <laughs> office, <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, yeah, I can't wait for that. It's, Ru- it's for it to be done and to be just like off my or off well, our plate. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing, like doing the just production side of seek one, the hunting and all of that is a full-time job Mm -hmm. and then you've been extremely focused on the business side of things for years and we're really making some great progress on a lot of different projects it just takes a lot more time than we ever imagined it would um and just finding the right people to team up with on some of these projects has really been one of the biggest things too yeah it's a time for sure a timing thing yeah yeah and i mean we're like we're we just now got to a point where we can financially afford to hire a team. Yeah. And so that's what we're, we're trying to build out a team right now. Like we've been trying to do all of this, just the three of us. We've had a bunch of irons in the fire, a bunch of different projects and it's hard enough to do one project with a small team. Yeah. I mean, you got a full-time job. Lee and I are full-time seek one, but, um, we, a lot of these projects are getting to the point where it's like the finish line is in sight. Yeah. Uh, but, and we are, we are hiring. I'll just go ahead and solicit for some uh, resumes while we're talking about it. <laughs> right. We're Let's hiring for it. a few positions. We'll, we'll post the positions on LinkedIn and probably our website here soon. But we're looking for uh, some key people to really start growing this thing. Yeah. 
I will which say, is super exciting. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, one, if you just see the evolution of where we started and where we are today, and really bringing on new teammates and new business uh, partners and stuff, I mean, yeah, we n- never imagined it was going to turn into this. No, this is this has been a f- very much a figure it out as you go kind of kind of thing, and I, I think uh, you know, like the the hardest one of the hardest parts just from the nature of what we do is we're in so many different directions all the time. Yeah. And it's hard, especially when we, cause we've been kind of hodgepodging. It's like, uh, we haven't had like a core office space. We did for a minute, but it wasn't like a permanent. It was a closet. It, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. It, a very expensive closet. Yeah. But uh, I, I think that when we have like an actual space where we can kind of all, yeah, it, it'll help the communication and like having everybody on the same page with stuff. But it's like when you got, you know, we're all flying in different directions. It's so hard to just like, you know, all kind of be on the same page with stuff. So like, hopefully we're kind of have figured a few things out where we can kind of hone in on some yeah. stuff. And um, when we're just, we're all wearing so many different hats. Yeah. Like there's, I, I see why, why people get business degrees and re- read business books because the more I get into this, the more I realize like how roles need to be s- split up in like different segments of the business. And it's really hard to be a creative director, an art director, kill giant deer, be a CEO, do finance, like do your taxes, all all this stuff. It's like you're getting pulled in so many different directions yep. constantly. You can't do any of the one things like as well as you should. So. Building out the team, but also yeah, the, the HQ is gonna be awesome, especially with having the new the new team members. Yeah, like it's gonna be a place where just our inter- internal team can gather and film content and hang out. But I'll t- I'll talk a little more about the process. <laughs> the, the HQ <laughs> I, is. I was about to say, I <laughs> see it coming. Help it. The HQ <laughs> is attached. It's the same building as the processor. Last year or the last year and a half, we've only had the front half of the building. Now we have the whole building. Back half is going to be HQ office space. Front half is going to be processor. And the plan for when it opens is to have probably bi-weekly events on Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday um, that are open to the public at the processor. So whether it's having like a barbecue guy, like a, a barbecue influencer come and do a cook a whole deer and like teach people how to do that or having live music or doing like a ministry based event. The goal with the place is that like open it up to the community and get the local hunting community more involved and just have like a, a hunt, a urban hunt camp. Cause that's what's yeah. missing from the urban hunting aspect. Like you don't get that camaraderie and that time, like after you hunt to go back to a campfire and tell stories and, yeah. and stuff. So well, it's, it's like, do, you know, the doe day, uh, just doing stuff like that yeah. more frequently with with the folks around you know Atlanta Georgia area. I think I enjoyed that the most of of anything we did last year. I, I wish I hadn't have been so sick with the flu that <laughs> yeah. I literally was there for thirty minutes I think and had to go. But um, we're gonna crank it up big time this year. Yeah. The, so the the feedback we've gotten has been so phenomenal. Like about hey you know I want to be I want to come next year I want to be involved like. I feel like most people we talk to, that's that's what they bring up the most is like the Dota. And it's just like, it's our opportunity to like, again, mix it up with the community. We kind of talked about how a lot of what we do is a lone man's game. Mm-hmm. It's really nice to kind of engage with the people that, yep. that allow you to go do what we do. And so it's, uh, yeah, I just, I think it's a, a super cool thing. It's also kind of cool to like leverage our sponsorships and partnerships to like get some of the people that support us some free stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. So I I guess I I don't know if I've totally cleared this with y'all, but I think we need to have that event, the Dode event, while rifle season is still in in Georgia. Earlier in the year. I I agree. I think the last weekend of rifle was like January 12th, 13th, 14th, somewhere in there. Yep. I think we move it up for sure. What I would like to do, if logistically speaking as possible, is have maybe like five days of doe week and. Basically, just encourage people to harvest those. Like we'll have, um, we'll kind of overstaff the processor during that week to to take deer. It'd be really cool if we could have like other drop off points. I don't know if that's going to be possible this year or not. Like have mobile trucks or trailers to pick up deer 
um, like an hour outside of Atlanta. But then the the Saturday night, basically the last day, have like a have an event either at yeah. either at the processor or potentially at one of the breweries in Roswell because I think if we actually advertise this thing this it year, be. it's going to be too big to, yeah. to host at our place. I, I haven't run this by y'all either. <laughs> <laughs> Kid Rock is coming. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you're you're vibing on what I'm vibing on. I'm going to try my best to network a little bit and try to get some sing some yeah, country yeah, some sure. known country music singer there uh to be involved in that event. Wallen. I don't know well. I know, I hit know, us up Wallen. Morgan Wallen bought a piece of merch from us one time. Years he back. Should, yeah. I I uh I know some boys that are friends with Wallen. Well, maybe it's him, maybe it's not, but uh I think that we try <laughs> to get wild. somebody to to, you know, be a part of that event with us and it's all for a good <laughs> cause, but um the uh, the getting replicas done and changing gears real quick, that has to happen. That's, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I I, I kind of had a scare, <clears throat> which we didn't really. I was I was about to say you you got to share that story. So I had a dumpster fire. Um, you haven't even talked about this room. This is the first I know. recording yeah, in this room. This is the first recording, and and for what will for now be our our podcast setup. Um, I didn't. I kind of got curious. And so I um, did the math on total inches of antler that are in this room. It's almost 5,800 inches of antler. <laughs> <laughs> All white tails. All white tails. Or actually yeah. one axis deer. But I didn't count the axis deer oh, okay. in, in, in that total. So uh, not right. that it matters, but I was just kind of curious because this, this is the first time I've ever had them where I can look actually look at them all. They were piled into a small room, and it's so cluttered. It's like... It, it was honestly disrespectful uh, in a sense to like you didn't get to really fully kind of enjoy each deer on display. And it's like I deeply appreciate this room because I can finally like kind of, you know, give the respect it deserves to like each of these deer where I can now see them all. Yeah, it's insane. And whoever curated this wall did a great <laughs> job. You, that, <laughs> that was honestly like I, I didn't know how that was going to go. But if you weren't here, it was. I mean, you you helped out hey, big y- time. Y'all so. did a phenomenal job when I left too. But uh, I had to go to work. But uh, it it's <clears throat> mind blowing sitting in here, um, just looking at. And what's cool, I think, for both of us is like having been a part of most, if not mm-hmm. all, of these in some way, shape, or form. Um, and and having like we're Kendall and I are both doing very similar things to what you're doing, and to see like the success you've had is insane. Yeah. Like we know how hard it is. Well, it's and just every, like every deer in here, I think every deer in here is from like DIY door knock, get permission. There, there may be some older ones. Like the only, kill on a, the on only outfitter or something. deer in here the would Texas. have been the access deer. Oh, the access. And, yeah. and the, the, that deer is actually not in here yet. The, okay. the, from buck, this past year. Yeah. The buck with Levi. Yeah. But every, every other deer in here is like every 200 in here. Is door knocking. Door knock. Anybody else could have gone and hunted it. I don't think there's anyone else in America that has a room like this that did it that way. No. It's, I don't know, man. I t- hate to get too corny, but it's like a little sentimental when you look at a deer amount. T- t- to me, like, it, it, this has never been a uh, braggadocious or, or beat your chest thing when, uh, with a mount. Like, I look at a mount as the preservation of a memory. Like, a memory that means more to me than almost anything that exists in this world to me and it's like i look around at at each mount and it's like each story is just like wow i i remember how much that meant to me i remember the people involved with it and it's like even my parents were down here and they were like my dad was like you actually remember every you know every deer and i was like yeah yeah and i went around the room i was like georgia and I, i was like telling the years i was like this date this year you know this deer, blah 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 I can't blah blah. Do, I can't remember years. I went around the whole room and I told him every single yeah, I one. I can't. Of them. I can't either. And uh, so it, that's just like what it means to me. It's just like it's a. It's almost like the preservation of so many priceless moments and memories in one room with with friends that were with every bit of these journeys and stories. Like it's it again, not to sound too cheesy, but it's like this room means so like the world to me. And it has nothing to do with like a look at what I've done. I, I don't feel that way at all. I just feel like very grateful that it's like I've had some amazing experiences that, and every one, every deer I look at, it's like, 
<laughs> again, I don't want to sound so stupid, but it's like I can get emotional thinking so you, about each story and journey. And you'd be mildly upset if the if your house burned down. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what I guess sparked this conversation was I had a dumpster that that I, dude I don't as part of this renovation. Yeah, you had a dumpster in your driveway. You're out of town on a fishing trip. I'm out of town. I think it was the rotten fish that had been in the cooler for a year, like composted and, and spontaneously combusted. Uh, why'd you even have to bring that thing up again? Like that was. I almost texted you last night and said, "Like, hey, let's cut this portion out. It's kind of embarrassing <laughs> for you." <laughs> it was bad. I mean, it was. Uh, I caught a bunch of fish, put them in a cooler, and, and I cleaned half of them. And I was going to finish cleaning the next of them, the, the rest of them, the next day. And it was like, you know. You forgot. Basically. <laughs> and they existed in that cooler in my driveway for like eight months. <laughs> so gross. So there was probably some nuclear, uh, I don't know, there's just some nasty stuff in that cooler. But I had a dumpster, you know, for this renovation. And, and here's here's my best guess of what happened. My best guess was, you know, I, I threw a refrigerator out from my basement that went bad. And there's like a lot of glass shelvings. My best guess is that the sun was like refracting through the glass in such a way that it was like a magnifying glass and just like had a focal point of the sun and yeah. just like sparked a fire. But I was out of town. It would, dude, it was a massive dumpster fire, like flames 20 feet in the air. And my neighbor was calling me. No, we were, we were at Gunnersville for our annual fishing trip, is where we were at. Mm-hmm. Some, some neighbor walking down the street turns and looks and sees this dumpster a blaze in my driveway and calls the fire department and it, it hit, it melted a kayak on top of the limo. That's like now plastered into the limo. And it's like, uh, (laughs) it melted the the gutters like on my house are warped from the heat. And, uh, it was funny. We were at dinner. You and I were at dinner. Yeah. And, uh, some guy walks up to me. He's like, Hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, uh, you know, my, he's like, my, some of my buddies are from the Roswell Fire Department. He's like, they put out the fire at your house. He's like, dude, that was a really close call. And uh, I was like, well, tell your buddies, I said, thank you. Like, with every ounce of me, thank you. For because, saving my deer. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we should <laughs> to go, hell with we, the house. Should, I just care about the deer. We should go up there and take them some steaks. Like, they, look, they, they yeah, are, we should do something yeah, like we that. Should, we should do that. Just go up there and meet them anyways. Because those guys are, yeah, I'm doing a lot of work for the Atlanta uh fire department right now for work and uh they're all just amazing people they get they're underpaid uh underappreciated and just doing something like that would just be like huge so yeah that'd be pretty cool I, i'm i'm definitely down to do that how about wild game cookout dinner at the processor yes. for fire that would be cool police. yes that would be yes. freaking cool i love it first yeah. responders we should do that yeah. for sure that'd be that'd be awesome but the the thought of the house catching on fire and losing the mounts like i i mean i kind of just told you how much these mean to me it's like We've got to have some of these either replicated or you can scan them now where it's like the it's on file to where if something were to happen, you can at least like have a taxidermist recreate it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, th- I mean, I think that that's huge. I mean, if you think about there's so many people out there that go on guided hunts and whatever and put spend all this money, you know, on and, and then pay for the taxidermy. There's a lot of time and effort and money put into this for entire sure. room. Everybody's you know, trophy room and to be able to have that just reassurance that if for some reason something happened that you could at least recreate that memory. Yeah. Right? Um, we need to get rolling because I think the guys are starting to show yeah. up, but I'll, I'll close with this little story. It's kind of funny. So I went to a, it was Tristan's birthday yesterday and we just like popped into a Braves game and, uh, I'm walking around and, at every Braves game, which I'm sure when y'all go to Braves games, people stop and say hey and stuff. So I had a few guys that just like stopped and were talking, whatever. And I'm walking through the crowd. It's busy. I'm walking through the crowd and I, and I see this, you know, 12 year old kid walking by and he's wearing that exact sequin hat. Like one of our brand new old school hats. That's, I mean, it's only been out a couple weeks. And uh, so I stopped him because I always like, which I know y'all do too, but I, whenever I see someone with like some of our merch or whatever, I always like just try to stop and be like, Hey, thank you. You know, yeah. um, just showing appreciation for that. And so I stopped this kid and I was like, Hey, 
I really like your hat. And he looked at me <laughs> like I was a psychopath, <laughs> like had no clue who I was. His parents were walking with him and they looked at me like, who are you man talking to my child? And then just like grabbed him by the hand and just like, just looking at me like, like owl eye, just like, let's get away from that guy. And I was sitting there just like so embarrassed, <laughs> that, like, you know, some 30 something year old guy just stopped this random 12 year old just to be like, Hey, I really like your hat. <laughs> Cause I was expecting it to be like creeper, <laughs> but it was our brand new seek one hat. And that's like, so did they figure out it was you? No, no idea. <laughs> nope. That's hilarious. Nope. So I, you know, I don't know if like, is I, there a police report out on you right now? Maybe. Yeah, probably. Maybe. But I thought that was kind of <laughs> funny. I was really embarrassed. <laughs> Uh, well, I enjoyed this. We definitely need to do these more often. It's yeah, just it's fun it, to get it, together and kind of chit chat. Yeah, no, it, it's it's one. We're all so busy. It's just nice to all get together and for sure reminisce a little bit and talk about all the exciting stuff we got going on. Yeah. Yep. Let's go haze some noobs. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I'm so down with that. All right. Appreciate y'all for listening. We'll catch you on the next one. See ya.